The design of steel connections is literally the most important thing that you can look at in any structural steel design. It can literally make or break your structure and many people have overlooked it and has led to disastrous consequences. So I'll be going through the basics of steel connection design to make sure that you can make the right decisions and things that you should look out for. My name's Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. So what type of connections can you have in a steel structure? So you can either have welded connections or bolted connections. Welded connections are quite easy to understand. You put two members together, you have some sort of plates and you weld around them to connect them. Sometimes this welding, because it doesn't allow for any slip, may lead to unwanted forces. And welding can also be highly variable based on where you're doing it. So typically if you're on site, you'll have a lesser quality weld than if you're doing it in a shop. And because you've got giant steel structures, you can't just put a whole welded frame together from the factory, plop it down on your site. There's also two main types of welds that you may be looking for. You either got a full strength butt weld, which is FSBW, or a continuous fillet weld, CFW. So the full strength butt weld, you've got two bits of steel, you made a chamfer, and you butt weld them together to get a full strength connection. Whereas a fillet weld, you're potentially connecting two plates together or two areas together, and you're just filleting locally in that area. So you can have different sizes of fillet weld. So you can either have a 6 CFW, or 4 CFW, 3 CFW, 10, 20, whatever size fillet weld you need. When we're looking at the full strength butt weld, as it was in its name, is a full strength connection, where a fillet weld has a lower strength. So a 6 fillet weld roughly achieves about 1 kilonewton per millimeter. So if you've got 100 kilonewton load, you need 100 millimeters of weld. If you're looking to resist high forces, you can just put a bigger fillet weld. So an 8 fillet weld, 10 fillet weld, or even bigger. There's a couple of problems with that. And if you go more than about an eight or 10 weld, you potentially need to do it in multiple passes. So the cost can be exponential. And also you're limited by how big a fillet weld you can connect two members together. As if you go too big, it can overheat the area and causing local damage. So you won't achieve the strength that you're looking for. This is roughly about 80% of the smallest plate. So if you've got a 10 mil plate connecting to a 10 mil plate, it will need to be a maximum of an eight mil throat of the weld. Any bigger, and you're potentially looking at an additional damage. Much like steel design is all about the connections, don't forget to bolt down the like button. Not only does it help my channel out, but it also allows us to get this video out to more people. And as we were saying that welding heats up the element, there's also another problem here. As we know that when we heat up steel, it's expanded. So if we've got a really long section that needs a long weld to join them together, if you just weld along them, the structural bow is essentially the steel is heating in strength, it's expanding, and as it expands, you're welding it together. You're welding in that expanded state. And when it cools down, it will deform and bow based on which one it expanded more as it's shrinking back to its normal state. So a way to get around this sometimes is if you do need to weld a member continuously along the whole section, you do it in a hit miss fashion. So you go for the first section, you might hit the first 300, then miss a 300 mil gap, hit another 300 and rinse and repeat until you weld it all the way to the end. Then you wait a day or so, or even just the same day, but wait for that member to cool down. Once it's back to room temperature, you come and repeat that same process, filling in the gaps that you've left out. This means you haven't overheated the element and you haven't locked in those out of balance forces causing the member to warp and bow. But as I was saying that welding is potentially problematic, as if you're taking it to site, it can get quite expensive as you need to get welders there. And potentially you won't achieve the same strength as they don't have the same level of quality as they're trying to weld up in an area which is not efficient for that welding process to occur. One of the most common methods of connecting steel structures is bolting them together. And this allows you to have the fine control that you have in the factory, putting the holes in the precise locations. You've also got manufactured the bolts in a factory setting. So you've got more higher control. So it's more likely to lead to a better result. It's also quicker as well, potentially sometimes, is you'll pull it up and you just bolt it together, it's already in place. Where if you're welding something together, you may need to wait. When we're talking about bolted connections, they can both achieve a pinned or a moment connection. So you have that versatility. There's also a number of different bolts that you may need to consider. So you've either got 4.6, 8.8, they can either be connected snug tight slash S, they can either be bearing tight slash TB, or friction tight, which is TF. If we're talking about the different types of bolts, that 4.6 or 8.8, .8, they both have their unique capabilities and used in their unique situations. Well, first start off, the primary difference between 4.6 and 8.8 .8 is its strength. So the 4.6 is roughly about 300 MPa, where the 8.8 .8 is roughly around 600 MPa. So we can see with the numbers, the 4.6 is about half the strength of an 8.8. .8. But just doesn't stop there. Do you just grab the higher strength bolt? It's not always the, for the right situation. They're also a little bit more expensive. So the problem with 
the 8.8 .8 is the fact that you can't weld it. It's a high strength grade of steel. If you weld it, the steel becomes brittle. So potentially it won't achieve the strength that you need. So if you're welding around it, you can't use that 8.8. .8. Where the 4.6 is a mild steel. So it allows you to weld it. So if you're using it in situations such as welded studs, for whatever reason, you can't bolt all the way through and you need a welded stud there, you can bolt it on and have it with a 4.6. If you've got members that don't need that high strength, such as bolting to timber, or to purlins, so they don't have really big moment capacities or loads that they need to resist. The 4.6 is better. It's a little bit more versatile. You don't need to worry about that overheating issue and it's cheaper. Well, typically if you're connecting steel to steel connections, you need to make sure it achieves the exact strength that 8.8 .8 is typically used for steel beam or steel column connections. 4.6 on the other end, as you can weld it, it allows you to place bolts more precisely. So for whatever reason, you've got tying down bolts and you wanna make sure the template is accurate. Typically you use that 4.6 in the tying down bolt situation. Spacing of bolts is super critical when you're looking at how you're detailing your connections. There's a number of rules that you have to abide by to spacing those bolts out in the correct locations. First up is spacing them enough so it allows for the installation to occur. So if we've got the bolt there, we also need to put a ratchet gun or socket over the top. So we need to make sure we've got enough distance around it. So we need to make sure they've got at least 55 to 65 clear of any flat plates to allow the ratchet gun to go on to achieve the torque that we need. The other concern as well is to make sure that you've got enough gap between those two bolts. So typically when you're spacing out your bolts, you'll make sure there's at least 50 mil clear between each of the bolts. That is your bare minimum. That's for your smaller type bolts. But when your bolts start to go up in size, you need to have a bigger and bigger gap, which is roughly about two times the bolt diameter. The reason for this is it needs to transfer shear through that connection. So you need to make sure you've got enough steel after you take out all those holes to transfer the shear that that connection is trying to transfer back to the structure. As we were saying, there's really two types of connections that you can have. We'll first go through the moment connection. Now a moment connection that's bolted together can either come in two forms. The first one is where we've just got shear plates and top and bottom plates. Now these plates have different functions. So we've got the central web plate is where you get most of the shear transfer. And that's similar to when you're designing a steel beam. So you have your central steel plate, they'll be typically welded on one side to limit the amount of work that you need to do and bolt it on the other. The purpose of this central cleat plate is only to transfer the shear in the location. The critical nature of this single plate onto the web is really there just to transfer shear. So typically you only need to make the bolts snug tight as you don't mind a little bit of movement in them, but it allows for that shear transfer, similar to what you do in steel beam design. Where if the top and bottom plates, you're bolting through the connection and that's allowing for the, either the transfer, the compression or tension force. So this is really for your moment fixity. So the top and bottom plates need to transfer those high forces and typically you will have TB bolts there as you wanted to grab a little bit earlier so we can have a more stiffer connection as a softer connection there may be a little bit flexible. Talking about TB bolts on the top and bottom of the plates, there's also another one that we talked about, which is TF, which is friction type bolts. Typically you try and limit or trying to not need friction type bolts wherever possible. It's a really expensive connection. Essentially you need to roughen the surface, you need to prep it. But also the bolts need to be torqued at a higher load. So not only is it more expensive due to all the preparation action, I mean they have a lesser capacity to resist shear. That slip is only there for service moments. It doesn't limit slip in an ultimate situation. So you only put this in situations where it's highly sensitive to movement. One pro tip, when you are putting those connections in, the ones on the side plate are quite easy. You can put them in either direction but the ones on the top and bottom, always make sure that the nut is on the bottom. The reason for this is if it ever becomes loose, you'll still have the bolt through there, providing that shear transfer. So you can come back and bolt it up later. Where if it's up the other way, the bolt will fall through, you'll have the nut resting on top and the nut resting on top really doesn't help you at all. The next type of connection is an end plate connection. These occur in a number of different locations. So you can either have this butting up towards a column, you can either have this butting up towards the wall, or you can have this as a base plate. So there's a number of different situations that you can put them in. Depending on the stiffness of your plate will depend on whether that's a moment connection or a fixed connection. Typically your thicker plates allow for less movement so it will provide the fixity. Where if you just need it for a base plate such as a column, you wanna make sure your base plate isn't too thick so you don't provide the fixity that you may not be looking for. With these type of connections or whether you're just beam to beam, beam to column, or even on that slab, potentially there's a problem with prying which is an amplification of the force. So there's a number of ways that you can deal with this. First up is trying to increase that A to B ratio to at least 0.75 to make sure that A is smaller than the B to make sure you're not getting those prying actions to occur. Next one is making sure you're at least spacing your bolts more than 90 millimeters apart to make sure they're not too close to cause that coupling action to occur. 
And next one is also making sure the thickness of your base plate is thick enough. So if you've got a really thin base plate, it can cause those prying actions really easily. For this, you want to make sure that the plate is at least 1.2 times thicker than the diameter of your bolt. If you stick to these rules, you don't need to worry about prying actions. Another problem that you can have when you're trying to locate, say, a moment connection fixity to a core is potentially you oversize the hole, so it allows you to have tolerance in there. Then you weld a 10 mil washer on the top to lock it in place. Good in theory, as potentially you've allowed for the tolerance that you need on site to be able to build it. However, what happens is the fact that you've got your 10 mil washer, you'll have a clear gap between where you're trying to transfer that load. That gap is causing a moment connection in the bolt. So the bolt needs to transfer not only shear, which is over here, which is trying to transfer over here, but as we have a lever arm, it's also transferring moment. And bolts typically, especially your smaller bolts, only have a limited amount of shear that they can resist in that combined bending and shear action. The main type of steel connection that you'll see is that fin plate connection, which is that pin connection. And as the name suggests, pretty much just a fin with a series of bolts in it. Typically these bolts, as you can allow for some slip and slide, they will be the snug type and they're only really transferring shear forces. But as they're not transferring any moment, you need to be careful as potentially you've got a connection that's offset from the centroid of the beam that's supporting it. That offset can potentially induce a moment that the supporting structure needs to resist. If you're interested in learning more about steel design and bringing your steel design to the next level, I've got a link to my golden rules of steel design that goes into all aspects of steel design to bring your designs to the next level. And if you want to support this channel, I've got links to my Patreon in the below description, where through a small donation, you can help make this content possible, much like these many members here. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.